All right. Um, tell us about uh, drive-through testing. We've heard about that. Uh, one of your colleagues who was here yesterday and she talked about it. How is that progressing? Well, great. It's um, one of the things that the Nigerian Institute of Medical Research is doing and to help with the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And, and the beauty of the uh, drive-through uh, testing strategy is such that it's helping to upscale um, the number of um, patients who will be tested. It's also helping to reduce the spread of infection because of its uniqueness. And it says that um, for those that drive through, the, they are kept inside their car, while those that, the pet personnel that will collect their samples are outside. So okay. it tends to reduce the spread of infection. The beauty of what we've also done at the Institute is that we've also modified it to allow those who don't have the luxury of their own personal cars to walk through and also get tested. So a walk-in. Yes, yes. So, so they, they walk into the center, they go through the process, and they get tested. And um, you can do a, a large number of um, cases at a time. And um, patients who are not so ill can benefit from this, that have this option, and it's completely free. Especially for those that have been told that might be asymptomatic. Exactly, asymptomatic patient, those with mild symptoms, um, they can go through this um, modality of testing. Are you alarmed by the number of cases we're seeing of COVID-19 in Nigeria? Well, not really, Millicent, um, for the following reasons. One, um, we are doing more testing, so we are going to get more cases. And even at, at that, we are not doing enough. We are still under 23,000 tests. And if you compare that to some other nations of the world, you know we are still far behind for our population size also. And if you also look at the fact that for our population size, uh, we, are, we are not reporting as many cases as those who have similar populations. So there's something wrong with testing. We still need to do better in that regard. So as we do more tests, we are going to get more cases. That's one. Two, we are also going through the phase where the disease is already in the community. We're having community spread. And then um, the recent lockdown has been eased off. So that's going to, in a way, facilitate more community spread. So I'm not surprised we are getting more, more cases. Tell us about some of the um, perhaps age range that we're seeing. We're having more, more, most of our productive young people who are getting caught up in the virus. And we're also having, witnessing a lot more children that are involved now. In terms of the signs and symptoms of COVID-19, how does it differ? Because it appears we're having more and more symptoms each day. Yes, it, yes that's not unexpected for a new disease that you are still trying to understand the course of the disease. So you're going to have um, a situation where the, the exact symptom manifestation is not so clear. And one thing about COVID-19 is the heterogeneity of symptoms. You know, there are cases that have been reported of young people who are coming down with cerebrovascular accidents, known as stroke. You know, there are cases of um, young children, particularly among the Caucasian population, they're having a purplish um, you know, fit, and that's likely due to inflammation of the vessels, you know, and what we refer to as vasculitis. So the, the lesson for this is that clinicians should be aware. You know, every patient that comes into your clinical care, you have to watch out for... For, for symptoms that may not be conventional COVID-19 symptoms. I have a colleague of mine who was recently isolated um, because he managed the patient that was supposed to be a cardiac condition from one of the public hospitals and realized that the patient had um, COVID-19. Uh, so people should be aware of any symptoms that come across their path, particularly those who work in um, the public hospitals, those who work in private hospitals. So atypical symptoms, atypical presentation that are not conventional should ring the alarm bells. You know, if you have a young person who is having uh, features consistent with a stroke, you have to investigate further. If you, have, if, you have, if you have used your conventional modality of management, you know, for instance, you have a cardiac patient and you use a conventional modality of management, you're not getting the right result. Mm -hmm. You should think of COVID-19. So we should have a low threshold for diagnosis. So I think that's the clinical lesson to learn from the highly heterogeneous pattern of presentation of T this condition. Tell us about the pregnant women, this vulnerable group in this stage. Um, we heard that Jigao, for example, recorded a loss in the isolation center. A woman said to have miscarried and then died uh, as well. How does COVID-19 affect the woman? And perhaps in terms of managing a pregnant woman that has COVID-19? In general, really, but in pregnancy, is that in, in pregnancy, the immunity is not as good as the non-pregnant state. So pregnant women generally have a reduced immunity. So they have increased predisposition to disease condition, and COVID-19 is not an exception. That's one. Two, if a pregnant woman comes down with COVID-19, it's going to run an aggressive course. You know, it's not going to be like the conventional um, case because, again, the immunity is also low. 
But what we've seen so far in women who have delivered, you know, pregnant women with COVID-19, that who have delivered baby, we've not seen uh, cases of um, mother to child transmission in the babies. Mm -hmm. That's one good news we've not seen. But, but we've also seen that mortality is higher because there's a case that was reported, you know, in the US where, you know, the woman, uh, the woman delivered, you know, but, you know, but she didn't make it at the end of the day. I, I think the lesson is that um, for pregnant women at this point in time, we should be careful in their care, they should protect themselves. Then my, my other worry is the collaterals of it. You know, some women who are pregnant, they are scared of going to the hospital when, when they ever have complaints or symptoms or complications because they feel as if the hospital is not a dangerous zone for them. Indeed. Then um, the managers, the clinicians who are managing the pregnant women, they are also apprehensive, they are careful because, you know, during the process of um, conducting delivery for a pregnant woman, you are exposed to a lot of body fluid, you know, like all blood and all of that. So you're also worried about that. About that. So there's this, this apprehension on both sides. And, and the lesson to take from it is that one, pregnant women should um, go through extra vigilance to protect themselves because the disease runs a very aggressive course in them. Two, pregnant women should have a low threshold to present to the hospital, irrespective of the era of COVID-19. Three, um, clinicians should not reduce the quality of care they give to the pregnant women, irrespective of COVID-19. What they should observe is universal precaution. Every patient you are seeing, you should don your personal protective equipment correctly, because you don't tell what that patient will have at the end of the day. So it's not that in retrospect, they begin to feel as if maybe I could have protected myself better. You should assume that every patient you are seeing has a tendency in order to have COVID-19, COVID and you should, you should protect yourself. And even the patient should protect themselves against the doctor, because, I mean, we don't do daily testing for our clinicians or our caregivers. All so right. those, I think that's the way to go about that. A lot of precautionary measures there. Thank you so much, Dr. Gregory Ohihoi, um, Deputy Director of Research, Nigerian Institute of Medical Research. Thank you for joining us on the program. My pleasure. Thank you, Minister.